archaeologists have finally confirmed a speculation that is turning everything we know about the fate of Pompeii, one of the world's most famous archaeological sites, upside down. Pompeii was not abandoned after the famous eruption of Mount Vesuvius in AD 79. That's right, the image of Pompeii as a city frozen in time that has dominated popular thought isn't exactly true. I'm Madam Archaeologist, your go-to informant on everything archaeology, and in this episode, I'll go over the latest discoveries that confirm that Pompeii's Roman history didn't end abruptly in the year 8079, and I'll introduce you to the updated timeline and story that's emerging from the new data. Let's dive in. The new evidence comes from recent work at a specific part of the site called the Insula Meridionalis, in the southern part of Pompeii, and the recent finds are discussed in this article published in Pompeii's own e-journal. The material preliminarily places Pompeii's reoccupation into two main phases, one between the late 1st and early 3rd centuries AD, and the second between the 4th and mid-5th centuries. So this wasn't just some short, very temporary resettlement. People continued living in Pompeii for a few centuries after the eruption. Although this was a very different Pompeii from the pre-eruption city, I'll get to that later in this episode. I also want to note that since we only have evidence from a small portion of the site, the timeline is preliminary, as is the evidence itself, given that excavations are ongoing. But the evidence that has been found so far is 100% confirmation that Pompeii wasn't completely abandoned after Mount Vesuvius erupted in AD 79. I'll go over the important finds here. Most of the data so far comes from archaeological work done at the Orea complex. An Oreum in Latin refers to a warehouse or storehouse. The best explored rooms of the Orea complex here are numbered 65, 66, and 81. Evidence for the first reoccupation phase was uncovered in room 65 and 81 alongside limited exploration of room 67 to 74. Ceramic fragments were found in abundance. In particular, we have terra sigillata, kitchen pottery, and fire-resistant ware, all of which date from the late 1st to the early 3rd centuries AD and originate from North Africa. Sections of North Africa were once part of the Roman Empire. There were also jugs and jars, as well as marble fragments that originated from buildings and other works. This particular fragment probably came from the base of a statue and features an inscription referring to the well-known public priestess Eumachia. She lived in Pompeii during the earlier Augustan era. A couple unique finds include a coin minted in the year AD 161, and the burial of an infant, also from the 2nd century AD. It would be great to get DNA from that infant. There's been some DNA work done on the victims of the AD 79 eruption, which I discuss in this episode here. So it would be interesting to compare the ancestry of the infant to that of the victims. Anyways, another interesting find here is what survives of a staircase built out of repurposed materials. This allowed access from a large window. Three steps survived, resting directly on the ash that was deposited from the AD 79 eruption. The staircase was made from reused marble, fragments of cut roof tiles, and rough-hewn blocks of nocera tuff. The people who had reoccupied the site were clearly getting creative, making use of materials they had at hand. It is also worth noting that since people were making use of the area complex after the eruption over many generations, the building had to have been intact enough to have supported continuous occupation within it. The second reoccupation phase, from the 4th to 5th centuries AD, which falls into a broader period we call Late Antiquity, is evidenced in the Orea complex by material found in rooms 65, 66, and 81. Between these rooms, archaeologists have found ceramic fragments, some of which originated in North Africa, bronze coins dated to the first half of the 4th century AD, and the remains of what appears to have been an oven or structure within a cooking area. Out of the ceramic remains, this lamp fragment stands out to me in particular because it bears the monogram of Christ, the Cairo. This symbol is associated with the famous emperor Constantine the Great, who adopted it after a vision or dream. We have two ancient texts, one by Lactantius and one by Eusebius of Caesarea, that recount the story a bit differently. Lactantius tells us in De Mortibus Persecutorum, that Constantine was advised in a dream to mark the heavenly sign of God on the shields of his soldiers and then engage in battle. He did as he was commanded, and by means of a slanted letter X with the top of its head bent round, he marked Christ on their shields." End quote. Now, according to Eusebius of Caesarea, in his life of Constantine, Constantine first had a vision of a cross of light in the sky bearing the words, in this sign conquer. 
Afterwards, Constantine had a dream where Christ appeared with the same sign he had seen in the vision. Eusebius tells us that Christ commanded him to make a likeliness of that sign which he had seen in the heavens and to use it as a safeguard in all engagement with his enemies, end quote. Eusebius then explains that Constantine had the Cairo displayed on his military standard, called the Labarum. Constantine is generally known for his role in ending the persecution of Christians in the Roman Empire and for favoring the Christian religion, the motives of which are highly debated. Regardless, his favoring of Christianity and granting of privileges to bishops planted the seed for Christianity to grow throughout the Roman Empire, and Nicene Christianity later became the official state religion in the year 380 with the Edict of Thessalonica. The Cairo has come to be an important Christian symbol, and finding it on a lamp fragment at Pompeii is very exciting because when Mount Vesuvius erupted, Christianity was still a fairly new religion and certainly hadn't become the dominant religion of the empire yet. So seeing the Cairo symbol on an object from post-79 Pompeii suggests that there could have been important social and cultural changes taking place there during the late antique period. This lamp in particular has been dated to the 5th century. I'm keeping an eye out for future excavation data because I'm curious to find out more about the religion's impact on post-79 Pompeii. Did the entire community convert to Christianity, perhaps after the year 380? Did any so-called pagan practices persist? How important was religion to people living among ruins in less than ideal conditions? There's no way to answer these questions at the moment with the very limited evidence we have, but I hope future excavations will shed some light. Meanwhile, investigations nearby at the so-called House of the Geometric Mosaics have revealed a late antique bread oven placed inside an earlier Roman cistern. The oven was built completely with reused materials. Ceramics from the 5th century AD were discovered nearby, while the surface that the oven rests on dates to between the late 3rd and 4th centuries based on further ceramic material, so this oven is from the late antique phase of occupation. A coin of the Emperor Constantine the II was also found in the room, further supporting the late antique date. And this oven is in a unique find at the site. At the nearby house of Champignonet I, a similar oven was actually discovered in 1936, but was, unfortunately, largely ignored in tales recounted about Pompeii. That is, until now. You can see the oven here, it has been heavily restored, but it was made entirely out of recycled materials too, built onto eruptive strata from AD 79, and is morphologically similar to the oven from the House of the Geometric Mosaics. At the nearby House of Champione II, we also have the lower part of a millstone, suggesting that there was a flour mill as well. This house needs to be explored further, but you can see here in this picture that the two bread ovens and the flour mill concentrate together in one area. So while evidence of services typical in Roman cities are currently lacking, we don't see a sewage system or any civic or public buildings for example, it's still clear from what's been found that Pompeii's post-79 inhabitants were able to at least meet their very basic needs. Now, the possibility that Pompeii was reoccupied had been under speculation before the new paper was published. There have been some earlier sporadic finds. For example, there's the oven in the house of Champione I that I've already mentioned, and the paper also tells us of the presence of 4th to 5th century amphorae. These are special types of containers that were used for transporting and storing certain goods. Diaries also mention further post-79 evidence at the house of Champione I. You can see on this map here where other post-80-79 evidence has been uncovered, but while these are obviously noteworthy finds, they are sporadic. They tell us that there was activity in the area after the eruption, and they hint at potential occupation, but they don't tell us anything about the nature of that occupation or how long it lasted if there was one. In this sense, the evidence from the Orea complex is significant, because it not only confirms that the site was re-inhabited, but it also tells us that this reoccupation was continuous, it lasted for a relatively long period of time. It also gives us a glimpse of what life was actually like after the eruption, with people living among the former city's ruins. With the new excavation data, it will be hard to maintain this popular image that the Pompeii of 79 AD is a city frozen in time. It's not so much an image that's held by archaeologists today, although archaeologists in the past did help propagate it, and it has prevailed in the minds of the public. While the volcanic ash and pumice did help preserve many aspects of the site that in many other burial conditions would have been lost, the ancient city isn't 100% as it was when it was buried under volcanic deposits. Announcements were made in the news when the new paper came out, this was in August 2025, so it looks like the popular narrative is already starting to shift. I also want to note that it's likely that material from this reoccupation also existed in other parts of the site that were excavated a long time ago, 
But since people cared more about the city at the time of the eruption, the houses with elaborate frescoes, mosaics, statues, and furniture, they didn't keep meticulous records as they dug, and now these data have been lost forever. Archaeologists have thankfully learned their lesson and now we excavate carefully and keep detailed records. But it is unfortunate that earlier archaeologists didn't care as much about learning about Pompeii's history in its entirety. I really hope that more evidence is awaiting us at the unexcavated portions of the site. Out of the evidence that has been found, what does this suggest about Pompeii's fate after the famous eruption? What new story is emerging? For one, we know that Pompeii's Roman past didn't end abruptly in the year 8079. It continued for a few hundred more years. And the story is no longer one of entire abandonment, but of adaptability. That said, post-79 Pompeii was very different from pre-eruption Pompeii. It seems that in the Pompeii that, quite literally, emerges from the ashes, people were living in pre-existing buildings and were using their lower floors, which had originally been the ground floors, as cellars. The settlement never returned to the thriving city it was before Mount Vesuvius erupted. There is no evidence to suggest that a public forum or sewage system was part of this reoccupation. People were salvaging materials and reusing them. And we can deduce, since people were living among the ruins, that the eruption would have formed a core part of the collective memory of Pompeii's post-79 inhabitants. According to Gabriel Zuchtriegel, Pompeii's site director, a post-79 Pompeii is beginning to re-emerge. It was not so much a city as a precarious grey populated area, a kind of campsite with shacks sprouting up amongst the still recognizable ruins of the former city of Pompeii." End quote. That said, life wasn't entirely somber. The ovens, millstone, and ceramics all suggest that Pompeii's post-79 inhabitants had formed a self-sufficient community. And the fact that the reoccupation persisted for some time tells us that these people managed to at least meet their basic needs. But who were these people? Perhaps survivors of the eruption who couldn't afford to build a new life elsewhere went back and made do with what they could. Maybe other displaced people in the region joined them. Living among ruins is still better than nothing at all. And there was an opportunity to search for valuables left behind at the time of the eruption. But if we look at ancient sources, we are told that the Emperor Titus sent two ex-consuls to help with the restoration of the Campanian region and the refounding of its cities after the eruption of Mount Vesuvius. So, it seems that there were authorities involved in Pompeii's resettlement, people weren't just squatting there. Pompeii, however, never regained its city status. That said, its inhabitants weren't a totally cut off and isolated community. Pottery originating from North Africa, as well as coins, tell us that the inhabitants of post-79 Pompeii were interacting with the wider Roman world, even if not to the same extent that people in pre-eruption Pompeii had. And just as goods made their way to post-eruption Pompeii, so did ideas, as is evidenced by the lamp boasting the Cairo symbol. A question you may have been thinking about this entire time is, so when and why was Pompeii finally abandoned? This might seem a bit ironic, but while Pompeii's Roman occupation didn't end with the eruption of Mount Vesuvius in 8079, it may have ended with the volcano's later eruption in the year 472 an event known as the Polena eruption. The material culture found at Pompeii so far doesn't extend beyond the mid-5th century, so the Polena eruption could have played a role in the settlement's final abandonment. However, the 5th century was, in general, a turbulent time in Roman history. There were invasions, there was internal instability, the western half of the empire disintegrated, and Rome famously fell in 476. So we'll need a lot more data from the site to truly understand the dynamics behind Pompeii's final abandonment. Maybe more than one factor played a role. And the settlement was vulnerable to begin with, so anything could have been the decisive blow. Excavations are still in progress, so we will hopefully find out more about Pompeii's reoccupation as more work gets done. I will keep you posted. As usual, if you have any thoughts, feel free to leave a comment. Subscribe for more cool content by your go-to informant on everything archaeology, Madam Archaeologist.